Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Political State from the Oklahoma. I'm Ben Felder here in the Oklahoma's downtown video studios. And joining me is a full slate at the stage, my uh, usual co-host Justin Wingeter, Dale Denwalt, and our two guests, newly elected senators from Oklahoma City, or Oklahoma City, Julia Kurt and Carrie Hicks. Senators, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate Glad it. Come. Yeah, thanks. Well, I have to apologize off the bat because I think it's common, you know, in the week since the election that you both are, are you do have distinct different dis districts. <laughs> I'll say that because <laughs> it's common that you guys have been paired together. Uh, you both represent Northwest Oklahoma City. You both flipped uh, Republican districts to Democrats. Um, but there seems to be kind of some similarities a little bit in, in your campaigns and your platforms. So my first question is, do you enjoy the pairing? I mean, is it uh, it's okay that we yeah, invited you? Sister, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we decided we're Senate sisters now. Yeah, so. it's all good. Yeah. We got to campaign together. Yeah, and we, I mean, because our districts are so close in proximity, we serve a lot of the same um, school districts, um, which, I mean, public education has been a priority for both of us in our campaigns. And so, you know, we've embraced that um, kinship ultimately in saying, you know, we want to work together on these issues. Yeah. Well, I want to, let's, uh, Kara, start with you, and then we'll talk a little bit, both of you, your background and, and how you got elected. Um, you're right, there are some similar backgrounds. For yourself, a, a former public school teacher, mm -hmm. What was really interesting to me about your race is we've talked so much about all the teachers that are running. Back in 2016, we saw more than 30 run. This year, almost 100. Um, and coming from different backgrounds and, and got into the race in different ways. Um, but really, some of the struggle, I think, for a lot of teachers that ran for office was that it was their first time. It's always hard when it's your first time. And maybe they had gotten to the game a little bit late. Um, you've been running for well over a year. I mean, this was obviously something that you had thought a lot about, that you put together a really strategic and professional campaign. Not to cast the others as not. Um, but this was something that you really took seriously. And you were facing you know, winning a Republican district um, that was maybe shifting a little bit, but that was also an uphill climb. Tell me a little about your background in deciding to run, and how did you pull it off? You know, my, my background is in political science. I mean, I, I went to school to study um, politics and um, kind of fell forward into teaching and into education and um, have obviously enjoyed that as, as being, you know, the best job I could have ever landed. Um, but it was no secret that that job was getting more difficult mm -hmm. um, to actually be able to execute um, so that all of our kids could su succeed. So, you know, when those frustrations started mounting um, at home, through different discussions, I mean, it just became really evident that mm -hmm. to, to get at the heart of what needed to be changed for public education, um, that teachers needed to be involved in that conversation. And having a background in political science, I just felt like it was a perfect fit. Um, you know, it, it was not easy, uh, but I, I picked a really outstanding team who just continued to motivate me and push me. Um, you know, Julie and I actually kind of set some friendly goals <laughs> as far as door knocking. Um, you know, and so when you have somebody who's, you know, continuing to, to push you to go beyond your own limits, um, because, I mean, that campaign trail is really difficult. And, it, I mean, it's easy to take some of the things that are said um, about politics in general very personally, especially as it relates to education. Um, but, you know, my approach was to always just receive that information and um, see, you know, how best I could could meet the needs uh, of the voters in my district. And so, you know, it, it was not easy. It was a lot, a lot of hard work and grueling hours, but you know, ultimately, it paid off in a big way. Yeah, and, and Senator Kurt, I mean, a, a nonprofit background, but still very much a, in line with education. In fact, I think I first met you through education stories and, and stuff like that. Tell me a little bit about your background in, in seeking this. Yeah, this I've, for the last 20 years, I've run nonprofit organizations that work around the state. So really, a focus on the arts and how the arts impact education and communities and economic development. So I've worked with artists across the state, developing their own small businesses, and then more recently, helping people advocate for the arts at the state capitol. So trying to help people across the state. How do they speak up for what they mm -hmm. care about? And I think that's what got me much more interested in you know, what the needs are of our state that aren't being met. Um, I'm a parent of two public school kids. They go to Oklahoma City Public Schools, and so that um, was a major motivator. You know, Frankly, I think major pivot points were mm -hmm. angry meetings when the art teacher was cut and the reading specialists were cut, um, and just feeling like no matter what we said, we didn't have enough people at the table who were speaking out for public education. Yeah. yeah. What well, well, I referred to earlier, I mean, both of your seats were previous Republican, you guys are Democrats, although your, your campaigns weren't overly partisan. Um, and there's probably a, lot, a few reasons for that. Uh, Senator Kurt, I mean, your seat was held by current mayor of Oklahoma City, David Holt, a pretty moderate. Um, Irvin Yin had your seat. Um, you didn't face him in the general. He got beat in the primary. But just talk to me. How, how partisan did you feel like your race was? How did you balance running as Democrats versus you know, running as moderates? And what is still you know, a pretty moderate part of the city right now? 
you know, that was one of my big concerns when I thought I might run was that I would, I've never been involved with partisan politics. I've been a Democrat my whole life, but I haven't been an activist um, and that's not been my focus. So I was worried that, you know, will I be accepted as a candidate if I haven't been involved with that? And I really was encouraged that more voices were needed. Um, and frankly, I was confirmed by people I talked to on the doors. Mm -hmm. They didn't want us focused on partisan politics. Um, when I, that blame game was, people were tired of it. I, you know, I knocked doors all through both se special sessions. Yeah. People were done with that yeah. kind of um, rhetoric. Um, so they were glad to hear that I wasn't focused on that. You know, I had a few people that were angry. I mean, I didn't put my party on all my materials because I didn't want that to be the beginning of the conversation because there's all these assumptions that come with mm -hmm. that. And having met with people for a year and a half, thousands and thousands of people, there are so many differences, um, and those labels, while we can kind of generalize people, people have such an unusual mix of values and interests and differences and backgrounds um, that you can't generalize. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I just, I mean, I ran on the issues, you know, I, I mean, education to me is nonpartisan. It's going to take all of us, you know, to truly, you know, reinvest in our kids and make sure that we have a better, um, you know, a brighter future for our state, you know, um, and healthcare. Um, impacts my family in a, in a personal way and so my, my son has type 1 diabetes and he was diagnosed at 17 months old and you know while our story is ours you know what I found over and over again at the, at the doorstep was that you know you could have easily taken our name out of that story and and you know people shared that struggle to be able to afford health insurance or to be able to pay for prescriptive medicines that they needed um, so I mean we just continued to, to listen to the things that maybe we disagreed on um, you know and I just said yeah, I hope we can always come back and revisit this conversation um, but you know here are truly the reasons that I'm running because I you know I really feel like we've got to have you know a, a louder voice at the Capitol for the things that are most important for I mean generally speaking the most of our constituents yeah and we talk about demographics a lot on the show and in print and when we do that we don't mean to take anything away from what were really well-run campaigns I live in Senate District 30 I know how active that campaign was <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I never met you on the doorstep. I think I was always working, but there mm -hmm. were always notes and literature saying, mm -hmm. hey, I just missed you, mm -hmm. Justin, I, I will have to come back or something. Um, but I, the demographics are changing. And they're changing in Democrats' favor. Did, is that something you even see on the doorstep? Is it something you feel on the campaign trail? Or is it just something that's kind of there and you're just kind of oblivious to it? I mean, I don't notice a change. I know, I know changing neighborhoods. Like, I, it was interesting because I, um, there's a really detailed demographic website that includes Senate districts, and I probably you guys know about it. And I just discovered it late. I'd already been knocking doors six months, and I looked at it, and it confirmed all my assumptions from knocking on the doors, which was around ethnic diversity, ages, which neighborhoods were starting to revitalize with young people. Um, so, I mean, I saw it kind of one by one. Um, you know, voters are still overwhelmingly older and overwhelmingly white. Um, so that, I was trying to be very aware of the people I wasn't seeing at the door who live in the district and who live in our community that aren't active voters. Um, and that's a huge concern for me. It could be beneficial even to not know those sort of statistics going in. You just go in and you just treat people like people. I mean, Truly, I it's... mean, I don't mean to be hokey, but like I really tried, non-judgment was a huge part of trying to knock on doors well. Because if I made assumptions about people, I treated them in a different way. I didn't really listen to them well. Right. Or I made assumptions based on how they looked. Anytime I did that, I regretted it. Hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I think there's some real power in, you know, just ultimately being a first-time candidate, um, you know, and, and again, you know, relying on that messaging and saying, you know, I'm, I'm a public school teacher, you know, and, and I think people are pretty aware now that we've got some work to do and making sure that our kids are, are taken care of in the classrooms and, you know, how can I do that as somebody that's wanting to represent you if, if I'm so totally aligned with one particular ideology over the other when, when, when kids are not Democrats or Republicans. Right. They're just kids. Yeah. Yeah. You know? uh, Senator Hicks, I'm curious, take us back to um, this summer, you know, you're watching the Republican primary and, you know, you're under the assumption you're going to face, uh, you know, an incumbent. Mm -hmm. uh, you had an open seat, but Senator Hicks, you were facing an incumbent, and then that incumbent gets defeated in the primary. How did that change the dynamics of the race at all for you? <laughs> you? Um, you know, I mean, it, it was a brand new challenger, um, you know, and truly, you know, we had heard maybe a month out that, that Yen might be in trouble, and, you know, of course, in politics, you just, in my opinion, like, I don't trust anyone. <laughs> you know, I'm never going to take anything for, you know, for granted or advantage, you know, and so, I mean, it was kind of like, you know, well, I don't, I don't really know, you know, if that's true or not, but, 
Um, so you, you had know, to get on, on with winning your primary. Exactly. Anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so when um, you know we we found out that we were facing a new uh, challenger, I mean that that was really difficult because he was not very um, outspoken on on why he was running. You know, it was some very vague language on um, you know more choice for schools, more choice for health care, and he couldn't really pinpoint you know what his stance was or how he would vote. Um, and as somebody who would potentially be representing my voice um, because he would be my senator if I lost, you know that was very concerning to me. Um, and I think it it should be concerning. You know, when you, you really don't know you know why people are running or, or what they hope to accomplish yeah and I think it kind of just highlighted the you know the, the struggle for incumbents this year sure in the past you know that incumbency is a powerful position to be in when you're running for re-election not so much this year uh, you know Senator Kurt you were running in an open seat um, how talk to me a little about running for Mayor Holt's former seat because and, and you know he's a Republican you're a Democrat but um, and I don't know that he ever officially endorsed anybody, right? I, I, no, I he, missed that. He's, he stayed very neutral. Um, my own, you know, observation is that he, while he didn't endorse you, he was very complimentary of your campaign, and so maybe it was a non-endorsement endorsement. But you know, a moderate Republican, you know, a moderate Democrat. I mean, how did you uh, you just tell me running in this seat that was held by the current mayor? Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of how did you well so that? I've worked with Mayor Holt on many initiatives especially arts related initiatives and so I just assumed everyone knew who he was and he's so high visibility as a state senator he's very good about mm -hmm. communicating with media he's you know he's been so high profile I was amazed how many people didn't know him in his own district it had been redistricted since mm -hmm. he had won so like I didn't vote for Senator Holt back when he was elected because I was in a different district yeah um, so there's a certain amount of people it's that but I you know I'm amazed um, how many people aren't keeping track of their specific senator? Um, so that was one interesting thing. And, and then other people, yes, um, anti-incumbent. A lot of people would say to me, well, if you're new, I'll vote for you. And I was kind of like, well, we're all going to be new. <laughs> so I need to <laughs> firm that up with some other facts, yeah. you know? And there were some people who said they never vote for incumbents. And I was like, oh, boy, that's going to be a difficult conversation if I have to go back and talk to them in three years. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you have a little bit longer uh, yeah. being in the Senate But now. there <laughs> are certain parts of town where Mayor Holt had such a high reputation and that was really important to people. Like, it was important for people to know that I respected him and, and liked the work that he'd done. Um, and I thought that was important to express. And I didn't feel like that was a reach for you, even though he was a Republican. I mean, it never felt like no, that was No, I think he did a, a lot of great work. Yeah. yeah. Um, talk, you know, education is such a big issue this year, you know, with the walkouts that happened in April and just this, this talk around education funding. You both have said it's important to you going this year. Everyone in the legislature is saying that education funding is important. I mean, the governor-elect is saying we're going to increase funding. We're, you know, the devil's always in the details. But I'm curious for you, given that that is was such a central part of your campaigns, how confident are you that next spring we're going to see a legislature that makes a substantial investment in education, in funding, and you know maybe some other areas? Yeah. Well, I'm um, cautiously optimistic. Um, two of our colleagues have already um, filed identical bills that will be repealing um, part of that funding mechanism that was put into place. Um, we know that two pieces of that revenue will be diverted in year two. Um, so, I mean, now you're looking at potentially having three pieces of the revenue package that, you know, increased funding um, in a historic way, um, potentially not being available to education's use in the coming year. So, um, you know, I, I, I have said, you know, I, I don't necessarily know that education needs additional legislation um, this year. Mm -hmm. um, our heavy lifting comes in the budget. Yeah. I mean, I really respect the budget that um, Superintendent Hoffmeister put forward, you know, increases in counselors, mm -hmm. like the huge, huge mm -hmm. for those support systems that we need for quality schools. Um, but I don't know. That's why uh, someone asked me, you know, what's your goal this year? And I said, I'm looking to leadership on the education stuff because I don't know that big picture of how they're going to negotiate that out. And I'm just going to have to be the strongest voice I can within whatever platform I'm given. Yeah. Well, and it's, a, you know, the Democrat caucus is a small one. Mm -hmm. So there's not much power. Right. Um, but I almost wonder if, you know, especially with you, uh, uh, Senator Hicks, if you know, being a former teacher, if there's kind of power in that, you know, voters across the state have said education is important. Republicans and Democrats, and everyone has a little bit of a different idea of what that means. But I think I, I think it's going to be interesting to watch you as a former teacher and you as someone with education background and, and, and a central part of your campaign. I think voters are going to be looking to you to see. Does it get your stamp of approval? You yeah. and some other teachers. You know, if it's not, I mean, I then it's, I think you know voters are going to be a little reluctant. I think it's time even to you know. 
to be you know very honest about you know what has happened to education so currently um, as of this week 2816 emergency certifications have been issued and approved through our state department of education you know i think it was six years ago we were at 35 you know in an entire academic year so i mean to say that we've 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 fixed education we've done everything that's needed to do um, you know is continuing down a very dangerous path, um, especially when we know that there are already threats to um, the funding mechanisms that were put in place for those raises. So, um, you know, while I'm encouraged to see uh, people taking that bold step and saying, you know, we, we do need counselors um, in the elementary setting, it's not required currently under current law. Um, and, and I think about my own experience in the classroom and, and having those counselor services available to my students um, and the heavy jobs that they have. Um, you know, with testing mandates and everything else that's put onto the counselor's role, I, I can't even imagine being in a school district where that's not the norm. You know, yeah. that there's no one in that role for the students. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think coming from the classroom is very powerful in saying I, I can share my experience. Um, and while, you know, I, I have a unique experience, um, there are obviously lots of school districts across the state where I've not taught. Um, so being willing to listen, um, you know, to how that rural versus urban, you know, dynamic will play out, I think is also very essential in making sure that we're, we're making things better um, and not worse for our kids. Yeah. No, I'm super optimistic about engagement by voters. Yeah. I mean, amazing, remarkable participation through the walkout. You know, I'm really involved with parent in engagement. Mm -hmm. How do we inform and help parents be good advocates as well? Because I think, you know, we can't count on teachers to have to do it for themselves. That's mm -hmm. not fair. Mm -hmm. Parents should be part of that, families, neighborhoods, should be a part of that. So how do we help them have the information they need to advocate well? Um, I know that I'm thinking about that with my communication. How can I make sure I'm communicating well with people? Mm -hmm. I remember last year people getting clued in about who represented them, what the legislative process was, what the budget process was. I, I feel optimistic that we have an increased civic engagement. Yeah. Well, there definitely is going to be more attention on education this year, but it's still Oklahoma after all, Dale. And I want to bring you in here because you wrote a story today in the Oklahoma about in this bill filing process and so I say this is Oklahoma and that means abortion and guns are always going to be part of the conversation <laughs> and heading into this year we, we see legislation around that as well. Uh, fill us in with, uh, with a couple of these bills that you wrote about. Right from the get-go. So uh, the, the deadline for filing bills is January the 17th but um, lawmakers can still go ahead and file their bills early if they want to uh, especially now that we have I think 13 bills filed already uh, as of about noon today. Uh, one of them um, is uh, kind of a, a, a try again from Senator Dom of Broken Arrow uh, to create constitutional carry. Essentially, you'd be able to carry a firearm um, on your person concealed or, or open uh, without having a license, uh, uh, like a handgun permit or anything like that. Uh, there are some restrictions, uh, but very, very, very few restrictions uh, to that. Now, this bill got all the way to the governor's desk last year or this year actually, just a yeah. few months ago, and uh, she vetoed it. And the, the big difference now is that um, uh, Kevin Stitt at the time said that he would sign the bill. So if this gets to his desk again, he's on the record as uh, supporting it. So we'll have to see if it even gets that far. Well, and this is a bill, you know, you say he said that he would sign it, but he's also a CEO and, you know, entrenched in the business community. This is a right. bill that often sometimes the business community, even Republican members of the business community, kind of are, you know, kind of, rein it in a little bit to say that may not be the best thing, especially when you talk about the convention business and, and sports and entertainment and that kind of thing. That's right. And, and the most important thing for Senator Dom right now is to get a hearing in the committee. Um, if, if his bill is put up for a vote, um, it will get support. Uh, it will get enough votes to pass. Uh, the problem is, is, is can he get it actually to be heard? Uh, he's got to get it heard in a committee. It's got to be assigned to the right committee for him um, and uh, a favorable committee and then it's got to get to the floor, and then it's got to go all the way over to the House to repeat that process. If it's amended at any point in time, it's got to go through that process all over again. So it'll be, I think, probably difficult for it to reach the governor's desk. But if it does, you know, we'll be all looking to, uh, to Governor Stitt to see what he wants to do. Well, and you look at, and I would, before you move on to the next bill, you know, I mean, House and Senate leadership this year are really kind of focused on some reform efforts. That's right. um, and it's going to be interesting to see how do they feel like this, kind of, does this take away the spotlight? I'm sure, you know, even though it may get a vote from, uh, you know, leaders in the House and Senate, they probably aren't excited to talk about this right out of the gate. I mean, there's some other reform efforts, uh, pro-economy, pro-business efforts that they're going to go under. Uh, real quick, since we have, you know, two lawmakers with us, I could probably guess this, but just for on the record, I mean, what are your, you know, early well, thoughts Oklahoma's, on this? 
legislation. Really believe in background checks. You know, it was. I, I, you know, I saw the stats lately, and I can't remember. I feel like it was like eighty or eighty-five percent of Oklahomans agree we should have background checks. I had great conversations with NRA members about this and about common sense gun laws, and that having background checks and safety in place is a good idea. So all I know is if Oklahomans speak up fully, hopefully their legislators will listen. Yeah. You know, I just um, always have to pause. You know, in in the time that we're living that, you know, are we really making policy that um, is responsible? And, you know, coming from the classroom setting where obviously we've seen mass shootings in, in varying propo proportions across the country, um, obviously, you know, I just, I mean, it's just absolutely terrifying to think that, you know, our kids could be sitting in that classroom. Um, you know, I, I'm also a gun owner. I'm licensed for my weapon, um, but as a parent, it's, it's in a safe um, mm -hmm. because I want to protect my family. So, you know, I think it's important to say, like, I, I recognize, um, you know, sporting um, and, and gun usage and, and responsible behavior, and I think anyone who is a responsible gun owner um, supports, you know, making sure that we're, we're making our kids safe, our community safe, our hospital safe, our, you know, our businesses um, being able to protect their own property rights, I think is very important. Yeah. So we saw the, the bill that would make essentially open, you know, carry uh, for abortion uh, in the opposite, complete, you know, uh, elimination of, of abortion. That's right. On the same day we saw Senator Joseph Silk of Broken Bow uh, in far south eastern Oklahoma uh, file a uh, abolition of abortion bill. Um, I was on Twitter today, I mentioned that there's uh, two big camps in uh, the anti-abortion movement. You have the, the pro-life camp, which is more mainstream, um, you know, just the general sort of anti-abortion, let's make laws to make it harder uh, to get an abortion and, and hopefully it will sort of dwindle out. Um, then you also have the camp that is the abolitionists, and that's what they call themselves, the abolitionists. And uh, they support making abortion a, uh, uh, eligible for the charge of murder. And that's what this that's what this bill would do. Uh, it, it eliminates every um, reference to abortion other than essentially putting it into the criminal statute. And uh, it would also prevent Oklahoma from defending itself if and when um, it's uh, challenged in federal court. Yeah. And, you know, during the uh, gubernatorial campaign, uh, you know, with so many Republican lawmakers, all of them were, were pro-life. Uh, Dan Fisher, Try, you know, tried to make a, a, a name for himself by saying, I'm the only one that would have a complete abolition right. of, of abortion. Um, and the other one said that it you know, kind of depends on, on the situation. But you know, Stitt is a very pro-life uh, you know, governor-elect, and so it'd be interesting to see how he handles that. This is such a, when you're talking about abortion, you're talking about a gender issue. And this is a bill filed by you know, a, a male legislator, not that you know, men can't have an opinion on this matter, but we have, once again, we'll turn to the two lawmakers we have, two female lawmakers, I'm curious, you know, uh, your, your takes on, on, on this specific legislation and, and the issue as lar at large. I just have a real problem with people assuming that, um, you know, having a, a life sentence, right, penalty for, um, for having an abortion is actually um, doing away with abortion. Because to me, it really transcends that um, as, as control um, over a gender. And so, you know, I mean, when we've looked at um, states who've actually lowered their rates because I mean I think it's fair to say that you know no one um, no one likes even the idea of an abortion you know um, so so to me how do we how do we actually step back from that and look at ways that we can can impact that in, in a different way um, you know higher levels of education um, definitely translate to lower rates of abortion. Um, so again, can we go back and can we invest those dollars into our classrooms and make sure that everyone is getting, you know, a certain quality of education? I, th I think so. Um, you know, and it's disproportionately on um, poverty, um, poverty situations. And so um, should we look at maybe adjusting minimum wage so that people, you know, have different options afforded to them? Um, so though if if those things were included in the conversation then I could you know definitely pause and say you know this is about really making sure that everyone is taken care of um, but since that's not included in the conversation then I just I think this is an ill-intentioned bill yeah, one of my good, sorry, big concerns um, you know what I heard over and over and over again is lack of trust mm -hmm. in our elected officials and that deeply concerns me I think it's a challenge for the public sector I think it's a challenge for the way we run government. It's a challenge for good public policy. And when we present bills that are unconstitutional at the state level, I think we're. I think it's it's not fair to the public. It's I think, our resources. Uh, yeah, 
I mean, and they get confused what's decided at what level. I had many people that wanted to talk about immigration to me, and I just said, if, if any state legislative candidate's telling you they can affect immigration, mm -hmm. they're not representing the, their office well. Yeah. And I feel like we should be honest with the public about who decides what at what level. Yeah. You know? Well, and, I mean, let's not kid ourselves. This is a Republican state. I mean, so this is, you know, largely a, a pro-life state. And, mm -hmm. and many voters who would say, yes, I'm for reducing abortion. I'm, I'm for expanding gun owners' rights. But I remember, you know, and Dale, you remember this as well, uh, I, I assume, you know, a couple years ago when Speaker McCall, you know, came into the Speaker's office, one of the things that he said, if not on the record, at least off the record, was that there was this, he wanted to move the caucus away from a lot of these social issues. They really, as you said, like some things that are unconstitutional and they come with these court challenges and they just kind of take you away from governing, government reform, budget issues and that kind of thing. And I feel like there's still, that, that sentiment is still there, that lawmakers kind of want to move on um, to the major issues of the day. Of the day. And, you know, there's so many lawmakers, these kind of bills are going to get filed. It, you know, it doesn't mean they're going to pass, as you said earlier. But this does kind of steal the attention away, right? From And you talk about the trust. Voters, you know, voters are like, I'm sure this you guys heard from voters year. a lot yeah. that this say, listen, we're, we're kind of ready to move beyond these kind of social mm -hmm. issues and try to fix some of the real problems that we have. Well, and, you know, as senators, we can present as many bills as we want. We actually have no limit yeah. on the number of bills we can file. And staff will tell us if they think something's illegal or they'll tell us what the fiscal impact is, but we can file it anyway. So just so people know that this is not like, this is the choice of mm -hmm. that senator to yeah. present a bill. Yeah. You know? And, and uh, he's introduced similar le legislation in the past. Um, you know, uh, he or someone working with him has come up with uh, kind of a novel way to, to write uh, it in legalese, so to speak. But um, he's, he's tried this kind of bill before. It didn't even get a hearing uh, last time. Um, but the, the thing is, and, and this was the case, I believe, with, with Dom's constitutional carry bill last year, the Senate needed his vote and the vote of several others who he ideologically agrees with. And if that happens again, if, that, if, if there's a voting block in the Senate or the House uh, that wants to hear these bills, they can hold up legislation that the Speaker or the pro tem really want to hear. Yeah, and when we talk about something being unconstitutional, especially abortion, that takes on a little bit of a new meaning in this you know, new Supreme Court world that we're in. Right. I mean, they're going to be, I mean, still unconstitutional possibly, but there are some that think, hey, I don't care, because if this gets in front of the Supreme Court, we may see a shift, uh, a reversal of, of Roe v. Wade. And I don't think Oklahoma is going to be the, the only state that we, that we see kind of make that effort. Uh, Justin, I, you agree? Or? And people are often surprised by what the Supreme Court does. There have been yeah. Republican Supreme Courts before, conservative Supreme Courts that didn't touch abortion. So. But there are Republicans that feel like maybe they can now test that again. Yeah, I'm I mean, sure there are some who would want to. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't and, know. In fact, in this bill, correct me if I'm wrong, I think in your story you said that this bill would actually, you know, restrict the state from sending an attorney to go argue it if it ever made it to the Supreme Court. And, and it directs the, uh, the uh, uh, attorney general to essentially ignore any uh, uh, U.S. Supreme Court or uh, other court ruling or any other congressional law or anything that goes against that particular bill, which uh, it's just kind of baffling why, why the legislature would would uh, would instruct the state attorney general to ignore federal yeah, law. Yeah, I'm curious if that's allowed. Is that really allowed? I mean, it's the final. I'll line. learn yeah. about yeah. who. <laughs> 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 about these things soon, right? Well, the, the the legislature does not decide what's law. That's yeah. you know that's up yeah. to the courts. Well, these are important bills to talk about because some of them we've seen make their way through the legislature before, so they are relevant. But this is also, as, as we close up here, you know, I also kind of refer to this as the season that keeps giving for reporters because with so many <laughs> bills filed, I mean, you can really, I mean, there are plenty of bills. I'm just, uh -huh. as a warning, and most of our viewers and listeners probably know this, there's going to be plenty of stories written about bills that don't have any chance of seeing the light of day. And they're probably going to make national headlines and they're going to represent the state. And as you said, it may just be one senator who has no limit on the number of bills that they can file and is going to put it out there. And uh, someday we need to just make a list of our favorites. <laughs> Um, but there's, so there's going to be some bills. Now these ones I don't think are, I, I think they, they warrant the attention because they speak to some really relevant issues given a lot of the political dynamics. But there's going to be some bills filed that um, they don't have any chance. Listen, if we're still talking about uh, a particular bill that you're interested in, uh, if we're still talking about it in six months, that's when you know you should think. Oh, I wonder if this is going to become law. You know, if it's if it's May and we're still talking about a bill, then that means it's progressed to to the level where it could reach the governor's desk. Coming straight from being an advocate, you know, I just see that all these bills require the attention of the agencies and of the advocates, and it, you know, it's just a, it's a, a strange process that happens. And you know, how do we like with education? We were talking about well, how do we make sure we keep education advocates engaged with what's real, 
because we've been talking about the dream and broken promises for year after year and how do you present things that are really could happen. Yeah. You know? Well, sometimes the goal behind filing a bill is that it actually becomes law. Sometimes the goal behind filing a bill is to get uh, some attention. So, um, and uh, as a process that uh, new lawmakers like yourself, I'm sure, will be <laughs> learning about in the months and years to come. So, well, Senators, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate Absolutely. you joining thank us. You. Good luck as you guys get ready for a, a busy session and preparing for that. With Justin and Dale, I'm Ben. That's going to do it for this week's episode of Political State. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next week.